The Animal Part 5 It was dark. Anne was on guard and vigilant. He slept underneath a cool shade during the daytime, while in the nighttime is when the real danger came out. Insects and rodents would come to eat the cocoons containing the workbook Zulu, but they only met with a spear or fist coming down in full force. Adam was guarding the cocoons really well. The moon shined everything in the silver light. It was relaxing for the young boy. He could see the vast stars and planets that hung in the vast empty corridors of space. But he saw something else that made him uneasy. Four large figures scalping towards them. Their steps were growing louder and they were making small grunts mid skip. Other apes. He readied his spear. Right, you guys want more? Adam heard a terrible, thunderous grunt from behind. It was a great towering bull ape. Its canines poked from its muzzle and foaming saliva was dripping from the mouth. Although it had a wild physical structure of an ape, its nose was slender with a slight indentation at the end. Its eyes were big and rounded. While the muzzle was much smaller than most apes, the ape looked more like a human that has gone insane with rage. It snuck so quietly that Am did not notice it at all. These apes had planned this ambush from the start. The large hairy paws seized the puny arms, holding them high enough to meet the primitive, wicked gaze. Then the primate opened its mighty jaws, revealing four large yellow canine teeth and bit into the weak shoulder. Adam screamed as the terrible teeth were tearing through his muscles. Instinctively, Adam jabbed his spear into the flat, hairy nose, causing the primate to screech and release its ferocious hold. The brute grasped his muzzle, leaving the critically injured boy helpless for the apes that were quickly approaching. Immediately, one of them smacked Adam away, while the other two began to pummel him in a volley of clenched, hairy fists. Is this how I am going to die? He thought to himself. Blow after blow, he imagined himself back on the island. It was the crack of dawn, and Adam got dressed in his usual attire. A poncho that was a size too big, some shorts, and a straw hat. He grabbed the bucket of chicken feed and made his way towards the hen house. A normal start to the day feed the chickens, attend to the house, and help his father with the livestock, return home, then start the next day the same routine. The boy saw something unsettling in the morning though. A corpse of a chicken hung across the chain-linked fence. Its entrails were hanging from the stomach and blood was dripping onto a small puddle. On the ground, near the corpse, laid small muddied paw prints that led out of the wired fence and into the jungle. Mom, come quick! In just moments, she bolted from the small hut and saw the body. Then, her eyes began to follow the tracks. <sighs> Jaguardi. Son. Get my bow and arrows. The boy handed her the weapons. Do your chores. I got some killing to do. The jungle was dense. The insects buzzed in a frenzy through the humid air while some of the mosquitoes began sucking blood from her skin. She was too focused on the trail though. The tracks led to a brook where it ended. Damn. She sat there pondering how to find the animal. Right next to the stream was a small cliff that had a series of crevices. Then, she caught a glimpse of a tan cat moving along between the cracks of the cliff walls. Ah, now I got you. With her eyes, she followed the small animal until it vanished within the cliff walls. Home sweet home. 
She scaled a small cliff. It was no more than 30 feet high and covered with a thick layer of slippery wet moss making the climb much more difficult. She finally reached the den. It was dark. The only thing that were visible were two green glowing eyes staring right back. She kneeled down ripped the bow and pulled the string back with the arrow pointed at the beast who hissed in defiance. Another pair of green eyes began to stare back, this one much tinier. She lowered the bow and arrow. Soon eight more appeared, followed by tiny little meows. Her eyes adjusted to the darkness and she saw the cat in full form. It had a white muzzle and an underbelly. It was two feet in length, and its body was so slender that its pelvis and rib bones were protruding out. The kittens resumed, drinking from the udders that were hidden in the soft fur of the cat. When Adam's mom returned, she didn't bring the corpse of the cat. She returned empty-handed. Am sat right next to Mr. Donzo, a cruel and vain man. He was the town's only hunter who saw it more of a sport, for every day a poor dead animal would be paraded across a huntsman's shoulder for display. Well, did you get it? No, it has kittens, so I can't kill a mother. Grinoda. Anne tells me that you are after some jaguardi, and you let mere kittens stop you for doing the deed? Bah! You should have killed the thing and let them starve! <laughs> he laughed heartily. Oh, shut up! The thing was just trying to feed its family. I will simply build a barricade to stop it from going after the chickens. Ha! A jaguardi always finds a way to break down those traps. What will you do then? Hmm? Well, I don't like your occupation. But I guess you will have to finally do your job then. Hey, I am damn good at my job. If creating orphans is your job, then you are second to none. Just you wait. Those things are gonna grow up and kill your entire chicken coop. Once that happens, you will remember this conversation. Sure I will. Adam, let's go. I don't want any more strange ideas wandering into your head by this jerk. Later that evening, Adam and Dronola were having dinner by themselves while Leon was tending to the herd. But Adam was too focused to even eat. The idea boggled in his mind. The cat killed our chickens, so we should be able to defend them. What is on your mind, son? Just what Donzo said. Don't mind him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But mom, our chickens. She sighed, placed the fork down, and looked at Adam. Son, let me put it to you like this. If I saw you hungry... Don't you think a good mother should provide nourishment for her son? Am slowly nodded. Well, what if I need to eat to provide that nourishment? Should I do it? Or should I let you, as Mr. Donzo so wisely said, let you starve? Am shook his head. Well, son, that is what the mom is doing for her cubs. You never, ever should kill something. Unless it is to provide either for yourself or your family. A shriek rang out that was so terrible that Abe ceased being the poor boy. It knocked Adam from his daydream. Before them was a tundra with the same demonic aura from the day the assault happened against the slavers at the beach. Her eyes were bloodshot red, claws glistening in the moonlight, and she had fangs so large it eclipsed the lions. All of the rest of the apes scattered in fear, but not the bull. It was more concerned with the slash on its face. It growled a low rumbling sound 
The woman responded by hooting and screeching. The bull stamped its feet and pointed its index finger at the young boy, then grunted challengingly. It might have been the blood loss, but Adam was certainly sure that the woman was talking to the ape. Question is, about what? And then with a grunt and a quick pounding of her chest, the bull had had enough. It charged in a rage and brought down its massive arms onto the slender shoulders. The blow would have crushed the shoulder of a regular man, but not a tundra. Despite having the appearance of a frail old woman, was as stiff as a tree trunk. Then with the quickness of lightning, she grabbed the ape by its massive hairy leg and dragged the massive lumbering body. It's screeched a high guttural scream while being dragged in the manner that a child would do with an old stuffed toy. With inhumanly possible strength, a tundra lifted the beast by its leg high into the air and brought it crashing down towards the earth. The force of the impact diminished the savage, powerful primate into a laboring beast, clinging on to life by a thread. She held the gasping face close to hers, letting out small savage grunts. The ape spat a terrible mixture of blood and mucus onto the old wrinkly face. She met the disdain by wiping the glob off and slapping it across the brute's head. With the strength of an elephant, she flipped the ape on its back, wrapped her powerful arms around the short, stubby neck, and applied a little pressure. The ape foamed from the mouth, desperately struggling to breathe. In small grunts, it called for its kin, but none had dared approach, for it would mean the same fate for them. She grunted one more time, tightening her grip on the beast's throat. A low growl escaped the untamed throat of the choking primate, and with that, she loosened her grip on the beast and howled out the moon in victory. The battle was over with the beast being reduced to a gasping, bloodied mess. She shot a shriek of warning towards the rest of the primates, who all hooted in fright. Two of the apes slowly but cautiously hobbled over and carried their beaten leader away while one followed behind. The last one following was much smaller, and it had a large, eerie smile forming on its face. The sky is turning pink as the sun rises over the hills. The boy laid in a puddle of blood, breathing heavily and clinging on to dear life. A tundra, although extremely breathless and tired, bolted into action, hovering out ear next to the still chest of Adams. A breath of life, though it was quickly fading into the dark abyss of death. Stay with me, Adam. She said while applying a large banana leaf onto the bloody mess. The boy was slipping in and out of consciousness, gasping for air through labored induced breaths. Any other being in the world would consider the injury too grave to even heal, but not a tundra. For within her hands lay the experience of hundreds of years of medical knowledge and used it to concoct a medicine so effective that the boy is sure to recover in a few hours. Drink this boy. She brought the pale liquid to the tiny red lips. Suddenly, the red bloody wound began to close up in such a rapid pace. Awoken, M gasped. He looked at his shoulder wound and then glared at a tundra. What did you give me just now? A special herb made from a flower that bloomed once every 50 years. I used the last one just now. As his conscience began to take hold, the terrible image of the savage ape man gnawing and tearing through his scrawny little shoulder with its powerful jaws was still fresh on his mind. What the hell was that beast? It planned out an ambush just now. You do not have to worry about that, just... No, I am tired with this secretive bullshit. He brought me here onto this floating rock, leaving me alone for months at a time, and now we have some apes that are smart enough to flank me. I'm starting to get these weird visions of an ape man telling me to protect the animal kingdom. I have to repopulate the planet species? Now tell me, why am I here? She calmly took a deep breath 
and looked at the frustrated boy. So take my place on being the caretaker of the island. Every time a caretaker of the island is selected, it is the guardian's job to mentor and groom the caretaker into becoming the next guardian of the island. And the island itself, well, it is alive. Alive? Yes, with the life force of all living things on the planet, for hundreds of thousands of years, Countless others like myself have been taken and raised to watch over the endangered animals that are on this island. When all the population of the endangered animals reaches to full maturity, then we release them upon the planet to their respective climates. Then we dissipate the island into the ocean and form a new one based off of the climate that has the most endangered animals. This time, it has two. The redwood forest and the savanna. That is why you have different sections of the island. Hmm, bringing back not just one, but hundreds of thousands of species must take a really long time. How old are you? I am 2,655 years old. What the hell? <sighs> yeah. I fear I may not last another decade or so. As for the ape man in your vision, come with me. But the butterflies. <laughs> Do not worry. No living being will bother them. I, uh, I marked my territory while you were recovering, she said, laughing. Oh, gross! From high noon to dusk, they traverse the dry, humid grasses of the savanna and into the wet, cold, misty moss-covered trees of the red woods. The foliage was so thick that they weaved through the trees, snapped through the branches, and treaded an ocean of long grass that engulfed their lower bodies. So, is the ape man in my vision related to the apes that attacked us? No, those are Java men. A troublesome bunch of brutes. I overheard that one of them did not come back from a trip for delicious yummy furry snakes being guarded by a hairless ape. It doesn't take much to know that you would be a target. Yummy worms? Questioned Adam. That is what they call caterpillars. You know their languages? I know the languages of all animals. Elephants, rhinos, a Roosevelt elk, birds, you name it. Adam never heard of such a creature. Living in a lush tropical island and briefly in the savannah rendered the youth very familiar with the trumping of an elephant, the balls of a rhino, the chirping of many birds by an elk? Well, that was news to his ears. What kind of sound does a Roosevelt elk make? Well, it is hell on my throat, but mm, let's see. She went into a coughing fit, then the barking turned into a shrilling cry that ended in a raspy bellow. Huh, sounds like a dying animal. Anyways, you should not worry about them. Let me take care of it. They look so... human. Is that why they are so smart? Looking and being are completely different things, Adam. I'll admit that it's pretty smart of them on how they ambushed you. By keeping your focus on the three while having the Alpha come at you from behind. Now that's smart. It was not smart that the leader challenged me. He knows what I'm capable of, but he still decided to do so. With one final crack of a branch, there it was. The object of the long journey stood before them was a massive 24 foot boulder that was covered with hundreds of red handprints. Stand back, she warned the young boy. With that, 
The frail old body began to transform. Her muscles expanded and contorted into a form that would put any Olympian's body to shame. With arms big enough to eclipse the most experienced bodybuilders, legs more well defined than the fastest marathon runners. Then, with unbounded strength, she hunched over at the base of the boulder, dug her fingers underneath a rock, and lifted. The dense, massive rock began to shift to one side. Behind the boulder was a deep, dark cavern that led into the unknown. Give me a minute, please. She huffed heavily. Her face became more wrinkled, and the very tip of her gray hairs started to turn white. The more calmer she got, the less wrinkles there were, and the tips of her hair returned to a dull gray color. All right, shall we continue? They began to traverse the dark cave. Adam bumbled through the impenetrable darkness, painfully ramming his foot into stones and cursing. Atandra, on the other hand, strode with the relative ease of a jungle cat, navigating through the branches of the forest. Can you help me out? What? I thought that you said that singing in the dark was a lame power. I take it back. Just... Uh, ah! Damn it! Just... Uh, I gotcha. Adam felt himself being lifted by two old hands into the air and placed over a shoulder. Thanks. At the end of the tunnel was a small, brilliant white light which emitted a rhythmic beating of a drum that grew louder the closer they got. Ah, here we are. Atandra settled Adam down, and to his surprise, he saw something that he did not even expect. A colossal cavern that housed hundreds of stone statues of beings dressed like a tundra. Some of them wore terrible skull helmets of different carnivorous beasts, while others had complex etch marks resembling statues. A majority had a combination of both. The statues were all muscularly well defined and had the same stoic expression. Among them towered a familiar ape made entirely of shiny jet black obsidian. The face sported a large screaming mouth, a long nose that housed two narrow slits, and large stony eyes. It had long locks of hair that hung from its scalpel to its back, its chest puffed out in defiance as if responding to a savage call of a challenge. Behind him was a large rock shaped in the form of a human heart, and it was covered with colorful veins. It pulsed with the booming rhythm that shook the wandering boy to his very core. This is Zero Sapien, the only one of its kind to ever have been born, the creator of this cycle and overseer of all life on the planet. Even in death, he has such an influence over us, and you experienced it firsthand through your visions. She looked on the marvelous statue lovingly, and then gazed at the confused and awestruck young face. Back in the savannah, the sun shined brightly on the broken tree stump that housed the small orange cocoons. One by one, each of them began to crack open and out crawled a black butterfly. Its wings retracted, heavily coated in a slimy liquid. It fluttered rapidly. The top wing was a bright burning orange, while the underwing was covered in large silver spots. First a dozen emerged, but then within a few minutes, thousands of fully matured workboard Zulu engulfed the dead tree trunk. Then the congregation shot out of the tree in a brilliant stream of tangerine and snow white, migrating towards their next adventure. Whoa. 
You were not kidding when you said that this island was alive. He moved as cautiously as a mouse in fear of the mighty fierce statue that stood triumphantly. For you see, she placed her hand on Anne's shoulder. Living on your own, out in the wilderness, and repopulating the species of one animal is to help you gain a better understanding and to get you ready for what is to come for the next decade until my passing. Her fingernails began to form into claws, but first things first, she said smirking while going behind the ebony statue and returning with a large clump of grass in her hand. The grass was hefty and continued to change color with each passing second, going from a bright yellow to a cool blue. Eat this. It was a pleasant surprise, seeing as she made him eat all types of strange things, just to get used to the flavor. What is it? This plant that you see right here is primal grass. Just eat it and it will give you the power of nature, of the animals, of life itself. But with so much power, you must need great control. And that's why I'm here to help you. We start by honing your five senses. She motioned for him to eat the grass. Adam immediately stuffed his face with the bright colorful grass. How are you gonna sharpen my senses? You'll see you tomorrow, she grinned. Thank you so much for looking at my content, and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you want to see more, and the notification so you know when it's out. Yeah, so thank you so much once again, and peace.